And what I try and do is for the, the quote-unquote not major fighter skill-wise, but somebody that shows up to lots of practices and lots of events, will probably impart one little thing, different thing to different people so they can take it with them. And then what I ask them to do is show as many people that as they can. So we try and keep the training going. What I do is I'm all about training. I joined the SCA in 1977 in Atlanta at that time, which was in the, was in the Kingdom of the East. And uh, I was squire to a Middle Kingdom knight who had moved there named Sir Hennecraig Gilchrist. Anybody know him? Oh, yeah. Long time ago. Uh, I did not know at the time that my martial arts background in karate and judo was going to actually help me in this, and that I also was a natural. I had no clue. And then everybody said, oh, you're natural with this. Within three months, I was training Hennecraig. So it was one of those things where fighting has always made sense to me. And what I've tried to do from that time on was pass the knowledge along. There's no reason to hold to oneself for one's betterment as far as I don't want anybody else to know what I know because they might beat me. By being beaten, you learn. You learn that there's a fault. And by learning there's a fault, you learn to work on correction. So a lot of the stuff we're going to go through today is based on that premise. We're going to learn how to train one another. We're going to learn how to look at fighting from many different points of view. Uh, one of the things I like to say right off, if fighting is not fun for you, don't do it. Find something that is fun for you. Whether it's inside the SCA or outside the SCA, find something that's fun for you. Lord knows there's so many things within the SCA that you can do that there, you, you wouldn't even have to get outside of the room to pick something else. So it's not like you're going to give up your friends. But if you're having troubles in fighting from an overall point of view, maybe that's a question you should ask yourself. Why am I doing this? One of the things I have noticed in the amount of time I've been in the SCA is that we should make room for the guy who wants to show up every other Sunday to fight with his buddies, the absolute competitor. Right? We don't tend to do that. The guy that shows up every God Sunday is pretty much ignored by the most of us. Okay? No quite our way to help him. You know, just, ah, that sounds like he's not any good. He's not serious about this. Who said you have to be serious? No real reason that everybody has to be serious. The absolute competitor. Alright. He knows the rules. He knows them so well that he is neither going to break them nor bend them, but he is going to fight up to them. He will probably never give up his shield. He will probably never, you know, subscribe to all of this stuff about, oh yeah, it's for beauty and pageantry. He's there to compete. Absolutely. Few and far between of these individuals on either end. So we haven't had to deal with a lot of them. But some of them, especially the, the highly competitive individuals, they have their own set of problems to deal with from the populace as a whole. Well, that's what's the We've got very friendly. You know, I mean, he took my arm and didn't give up his shield. Never gets up the shield, and he's out there to win. Okay, it's fine. So a lot of times, you know, we have to we have to look at fighting from a lot of different perspectives, and that's why I bring this up. It's the fact that we have those two broad ranges. I mean, from the guy who is absolutely competitive to the guy who couldn't really care less about winning. He's there to have a good time. So we'll start out with. Let's look at our martial art. <laughs> Have no doubt, this is a martial art. A lot of people want to call it a sport. Sport usually indicates score. We don't keep score. We don't keep track of how many, how many fights people win. We don't keep track of how many fights. You know, they, they, they won with a sword and shield and done with this. And, oh, he hit what's his name, so that's two points for him. We don't do that. So for us, if we look at this from a martial arts point of view, then we can delineate quite a few things. If we look at our sport from, where is it based? Okay, we have two sides basically. We have offense and we have defense. Now how complicated is our sport? Okay, let's go through offense. We can delineate this fairly easily. Offense is the ability to put a weapon Minimum diameter? One and one quarter inches. 
exactly. The surface of which comes in contact with armor. How small is that surface? Let's break this down even to, to its nth degree. Quarter inch, three eighths maybe. Okay. If it's if it's flat, then you've got it. You've got an inch and a quarter. It's rounded. It depends on the diameter. So all of a sudden, you've got the widest bit at inch and a quarter. So we're going we're to say it's the ability to place. Ooh, I got 
that's going to stick. He really wants to hit you. And he's looking, he's looking. He's like, you, and you watch him, they're all tensed up and wandering around like this. He's like, okay, is that leg open? Okay, is that leg open? And they're trying to get close to him. Am I close enough? And they've got all this metal process going on. Finally, there's a physical process. Whether it's falling over dead, actually trying to swing at you, there's a physical process. Unfortunately, out of that, we get what's called, an, I call it an action. Something happens. They move, they may lean over real far, they may lean forward, they may actually work forever. Well, whatever it is, it's an action. You're out with pelvis, as we so often call them. They, too, are standing here. But some of them, have trained and practiced enough that you can get either one at a moment. This guy suddenly swims and, and, and he's like, wow, that was really cool. But I got no idea why I swung it. Or he's standing there and he's still doing the same thing. He's like, well, I don't know whether I should move or not. And suddenly he falls over the dead. He's kind of trapped in between the two. And every once in a while, you get one or the other. But there's still an action because, as he said, I don't know how I did that. I don't know why I did that. The last guy, this guy here, the way he's a competitor or not, is the guy you got to watch out for. This is the guy who's caught with everything. Now, physical. Okay. Martial arts students? And? Okay. Key? Anybody familiar with the term key? Or chi in the Chinese forms? Body and mind coordination to perform a function. This guy doesn't give you an action, he gives you a reaction. He's not really standing there thinking about what you're about to do or anything else, but he will respond in kind to what you do for him. He's not just standing there and just going, okay, when he moves that leg, I'm going to hit him in that leg. Whatever target you open, he will go to, based on his percentages up here, as far as his training, knowing that the risk may or may not be valuable enough for him to take that shot. So here's the guy, he's just standing there. He may have a sword here, he's just resting. He may carry it high, he may be wandering, he may be doing the old cobra thing where, the, where he's bobbing and just watching what you're going to do for him. If we could train everybody to this form, that would be marvelous, but it takes quite a bit of intent. Martial arts students will understand that. First time you go in the dojo, sensei knocks you on your katukas. And you're sitting there going, that was really weird, but I didn't I swear you didn't move. The guy's 60 years old, and he's crippled. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I can't let a crippled old man be me. So you're thinking, well, that's not going to happen again. And it happens again and again and again. And he's just reacting. Most martial arts sensations we'll run into will tell you that you should just relax. That's the one thing, if I, if I could get everybody in here to do, was just relax when you're fighting. Fighting should be as relaxing as sitting at home in your favorite chair, watching your favorite TV show. If you're all hyped up, how can you possibly deal with about what's about to happen? Especially in a war scenario, how can you pay attention to what's going on if you're all hyped up? You're all hyped up. You know. Journey jitters. Any experience with that? No. Not at all. No, of course not. Everybody just sitting there going, oh, wow, fight. And then you go out in the first round, it's like, that was good. That was real good. It was real good for the other person because he's standing there and he's not really as hyped up as you. Happens to everybody. So, if we can train to this, everybody, anybody who is not one of these three, all of the aliens, raise your hand. Yes, you? I, I'm somewhere off to the right so far. He does know. So you don't have a mental function? Or you <laughs> Which way is <laughs> So. But it's one of those things that when you, when you start to look at it, how people yeah. <laughs> react to certain things. Now, the, now the one thing is, you may tend to move back and forth between those three. You know, it's rare that we find that person that can win 
every tournament they have. We've had it. I think every kingdom's had it. <laughs> but they are a rarity. So, how did that person who became that totally reactive person get there? Well, let's look at the three forms that we will be used. We'll run out of things. Way to go, aren't you? Great, so we're bored. Pardon me? <laughs> you were in the military, the word is not stolen, the word is appropriated. I want to train 
you to do a mental function. What are you going to train me to do? I'm going to train you to block. That's a physical function. Ah, it doesn't start there. It doesn't start in your hand. It starts up here. I've actually had students tell me, I don't think backwards. Oh, Mr. Video Camera says you lie. <laughs> Mr. Video Camera says you lie big time. Okay? And, and one of my students gave me back so far there was no way he could defend it. Okay? Because he was just leaning back so far that the shield came up and his leg was just wide open. But yet he swore that he never did. I do not lean back. First time in the backyard with his video camera on, that ended that. And fortunately, it was one of those things where by doing that, that mental image of this made him pay attention to it. Oh, I'm leaning. I'm leaning. Right? Video cameras have got to be one of the greatest training aids ever invented because you can't lie to them. They can tell you all they want that I don't do this or I do this. No, you don't do that either. So, trying to train somebody into the physical is far easier than training them into the mental. Because I can tell you how to do something. Based on what you got from me mentally, you would attempt it. It'd be like the old game. Start the message here, and then go back there and see what, what comes out. You know, it's like, why didn't you do that? I didn't tell you. You did too. You told me to do this and this. No, that's what you heard, but that is not what I said. And there's, there's some drills that we can do to prove this fact. Now, the, the nifty thing about having all three is somewhere in between here is where we start defining our skill sets. Okay? Get to combat, oh, I'm really having a hard time throwing a rap. Okay? I can throw the rap to the back of the leg, but I can't throw the rap to the back of the leg. Now, which is an interesting form when you think about it, because both of them, physics is a wonderful thing, when you go to throw a rap, a lot of people, they take that term and they, they think it's this one. Because you're throwing a rap around. They're thinking, okay, well, I can wrap around. So a lot of times, their mental image is based on what we say. The novice thinks wrap around. Okay, I can do this. But one of the nifty things about the lowering wrap is the fact that if you leave your sword just sitting here, you let it fall off your shoulder, what's it going to do? It just wraps. It's perfect. You try and tell somebody how to do this, and they're like, no, 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 just, just kind of do this. Explain that in words. How many words would it take? Depends on the student. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> depends on the student. It depends on the student. I want you to throw a snap. Which kind? Uh, smart student. Okay. Snap, snap wrap, reverse wrap, reverse snap wrap. What did that guy say? Yeah. Also, reverse snap wrap. There's no such thing. I'm not a smart student. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounded good, right? Whether the wrap around is from here and goes out and over, or whether it's a, whether it's, it's a lowering wrap, whether it starts here and comes in and does the reverse, all wraps dramatically different. Dramatically different. All of a sudden, the training level required goes up. First wrap is fairly easy. This one's even easier. You get in that reverse wrap, I guarantee you, you've got some people with some sore wrists when they try that the first couple of times. I'd be very careful. That's where, by the way, it's really good to throw that when the guy's shield is up so he can't see it because if you throw this when his shield is down, he's going to be looking at that going, you know, that guy's got his hand in the helmet box. I think I'll throw that blow right into the helmet box. If you don't get hit in the helmet, you might get hit in the hand. So there's a lot of issues to, to be careful with when you're training, practicing, or you're in combat. One of the other things that follows along with this, obviously, is the two, usually the two most intensive mental functions happen here and here. Because you get into combat and you're thinking, I really got to watch. I'm not reactionary, right? He's not thinking that at all. He's hoping you're doing that. Which will lead us into the types of blows. I like breaking this down basically into there's two types of blows. This is the way I explain it. By the way, there's no one way to fight. Never has been, never will be. Which leads us obviously to the conclusion that there's no one way to train and no one way to practice. Okay. So what I'm saying 
Maybe good for you, maybe not. Take away what you can, throw away what you don't want. Okay? No ego here. We try and share. If there's what you'll find is when we're when we're training and we're practicing today and tomorrow, I'll be asking you things. Why? So I can learn. Because I'm still a trainee. I will be a perpetual student of this martial art forever. So, two types of blows. Basically, you have the ones that your opponent gives. Of his own. The way he stands. The way he walks. The way he throws a shot. Whichever. He throws that snap and he does this. You know for a fact that this is open. And when he walks, he gets that leg out in front, pulls the shield to him. You know for a fact that when he closes, there's opportunity not only in the upper body, but in the lower body. So he's giving these types of targets to you. So it's like, this is great. This is really great. This works out well for me. I like this. Now, having noticed that, that if you turn him towards his shield, he will do this for you. Smart students say, okay, I'm going to do that again. I missed it the first time. But I'm going to cause him to turn again and take advantage of the targets that present themselves. Now, a lot of us, we do this all the time. We're watching for that target. He's giving it to us. If he wasn't giving us the target, we wouldn't shoot. But how many times have we actually intentionally turned that opponent a specific way to hit him? And that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. And then we're going to say one of the opponent. is forced to give. This not only covers the fact that he moves in a, in a way whenever he shoots or whenever he turns. This one also covers, I'm going to throw a fake. I'm going to make this blow look real enough that this person will respond to it for me. But we just forced him to give us a bunch of targets. Now whether we can get to them or not, depends on us. Sometimes you're in a fight, guy throws a fake, you don't get hit, but you know for a fact when that shield comes back in place, boom, all kinds of things are open, he's just standing, he's grinning, this guy is just grinning at you. And you're thinking, my guy, I wish you could hit me because now I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I have no clue now. I, I, I am just lost. I actually had well, my first student, what well, is now, Duke, sort of stuck in the back of him in the West. And he had a bad habit. I would throw what's well, called a wavy rising, which comes up. And for some reason, Steve's response to this was to pull his heater shield all the way to this side and then lean his head over and stick his head up. <laughs> <laughs> now, after umpteen million times of hitting him on that nice little ledge he had provided, I finally found a way to break this student from doing this. I will throw the first part. Move his shield over, he lean his head over, and I laugh at him. <laughs> Believe it or not, it worked. That got him so upset, he stopped doing that almost <laughs> It's just one of those things, you have to find a way to get to the student. Hitting him again and again wasn't working. So I figured, all right, I'll make fun of him again and again. And finally, it went away. So, you can force your opponent, He's going to give you things all on his own. The big deal here is, is to notice when he's giving them to you. That reactionary fighter, he's tuned. Okay? He is ready. So let's go into what causes we can affect as far as those targets, how they work. We've already gone into offense and defense. Go ahead, Mark. What I try to do 
and obviously was trying to break this all down as simply as we could. So I tried to come up with what do we do on offense and defense every time. I tried to break it down into terms that were useful to everybody that I encountered so they would understand it versus trying to put in all the nuances and the shifty stuff and the tricky bit. On offense and defense, the primary thing that you have to have is range. You have to know yours, you have to know your opponents. That doesn't just mean how tall is he? Right? How long is that sword he's got? You fight with a mace? Back with a pole arm, back with a great sword. All of a sudden, the range differential between a guy with a pole arm and a guy with a sword and board changes dramatically. Okay? So we have to pay attention to that. On offense, we have target recognition. Swinging his arm comes out all his arm. Okay. Offside body looks like it'll work real well. Snap wrap, snap. Okay. Which leads us to the next one. Blow selection. Shot selection. What am I going to do to get that target? Either one. 
if your opponent goes first, block and strike. If you go first, strike and block. Okay? There are not a lot of people that train into that. We, we are trained to do a lot of shots. We are trained to do defenses. A lot of times we're not trained to do them both at the same time. So all of a sudden, our little two rules here, based on everything we've just been through, based on these two extremes, it's like, wow, all of a sudden, nice, my, my martial art just got real big. Okay? So, based on that, Maybe he keeps it too close, so he hasn't got enough time to try to get out of there. 
but the person trained in practice to do that. Some really bad person said, just keep your shoe close to you and don't move it much. That's really good for me because I'm winning. If they got any training at all, which is where we were going next. Okay, so now how do we get training? I like to start with video tapes, watching other people. Okay. Ask. Exactly. Number one answer ask. Okay. How many other belted and beginners come to you and ask for training? Not near enough. Now for me as a trainer, I would find him. Oh, that looks like a new person. Let's go see what he do. Let's see what, what he'd like to learn. Let's see if he's, he wants to learn at all. There are some people who just rather just watch. You know, maybe, they're, maybe they don't want to be embarrassed by not being able to do what you ask. I actually had a trainee at one point get so nervous and so locked up tight that he couldn't do anything. And when I finally got him into the garage with one of the senior trainees, and we asked him, because the senior trainee and he were really good friends, and he didn't understand why he was locking up either. Why are you doing this? Why aren't you relaxing? Because I don't want to disappoint you. What? <laughs> you don't want to disappoint me. Well, I don't want you to think you're wasting your time. And it was just one of those things where he had locked that in, and he had grabbed onto that. Okay, so he had totally messed up his, his mental phone. Okay. We kept trying to tell him, relax, relax. And that was the thing that I tried to get all the trainees to do that I've ever trained was to relax. Because until they were relaxed, they weren't really learning. They were trying to figure out what trick I was doing next. There was no trick. And we'll find out here. We're going we're to do some things, and you're going to swear that that's a trap or a trick, and you're not going to get into the drill until you realize that. And once you realize that, you, you'll suddenly think, oh, this is really free form. I can really do this. Okay. One of the primary things we do, or that I do, sorry, And then you have to have the target to pull that trigger. Is there not? If you, if you would bring a broadsword with you or just. Remember, sword and scissors and the bar. Now, the trigger drill was something that, that I decided I, I needed something to get everybody started. No, I didn't cut the point off my heater. This is a bunny round. Everybody goes, how come you cut your heater down? It wasn't a heater. She went up forever, it seems like. Everybody looks going, cool. look at his legs. Hey, go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. That's what everybody says. And then, just like with, with Duke Radnor, you'd see you hear people that practice, whack, they didn't even like it, done it, and they're going, oh, no. Because he's used to fighting on his knees. With one of these, you get used to it. <laughs> Especially when you're learning. So those of us that use these, we like being on our knees. So, okay, the trigger drill is basically that. I'm going to try and teach you to be a reactionary fighter. Therefore, I need a way to develop a trigger of your reaction to the target that I give you. Okay? One of the primary things is I'll stand. And then I tell the person, okay, with your weapon, get in range. Why? Because remember those five things we're going to do on offense and defense? We're going to set them up to where, number one, they can't fail. Okay? So with that weapon, go ahead and get in. in no separation? No, no separation. No, yeah, no separation. So, so, where, so where you know for a fact okay, that you're set to go. Okay, now from here, I'm pretty well defended. I'm not really leaving anything open other than that leg. But the drill is, is that as I move, you move. So as, as I start to move something, you go for a target that's open. Right. So if I start to move the shield here, okay, in recognition of that fact, he will, he will react. Okay. So we just start this way, and then you just move. Say, now, is that a really good choice? No. If it connects. Okay. So based on that fact, we know that there was a response to it. Now, the trigger drill starts out fairly slow like this because everybody thinks this is a trick. 
no trip. This is fighting taken right down to its basic level. We're standing here, we're squared off, and then I start to move. Sometimes it takes a little longer to get my students. <laughs>
this one drill, I can step forward very slowly, right, to see if as soon as I start to, he responds to the offset. Right? And I can do it very slowly backwards to see if as I start, not when I'm here, but right here. Okay. Now we can actually take that later on, and as he pushes forward, if he knows for a fact that I will repeat that foot, okay, we went back to the opponent gives you what the opponent can be forced to give you. All of a sudden, you can use that here. This is one of the primary drills. Very simple to do. And we will work, that's one of the drills we will work on with everybody. Because it helps not only the novice, but it helps the experienced fighter who is having a problem in one set area. Now we can actually go through the physical maneuver of throwing an offside shot, which we'll do later in armor, okay, and find out why this one individual may be having a problem. Or may not. Maybe it's not a problem. Okay, it may be your perception that there's something there. And so when you when you go to do it, your mind and your body just aren't really into it. Okay, it's like the guy who told me he wasn't leaning backwards. To him he wasn't. The person says, I'm having trouble with my worst the worst thing I do is throw the offside. Okay, who's who who is who's what's your mouse blocked? I probably blocked my Offside? I personally think it's offside. So do you feel? Oh, you can't get one of the two. It's not warm. It is the weakest area. Right. But it's one of those things where even though you may consider that you don't do something well, or that you're having a problem with something, ask other people. Perfect example, His Majesty Sean, who I'm working with now in Artemisia, he and two other fighters have fought one whole thing, have fought one another continuously for years. You can't get these guys to kill one another, from their point of view. So I finally got all three of them in the same place, sent two of them out, and said, okay, fight one another. You would not believe what these two knights were doing. They did the same thing again and again and again. And if you watched them, you would swear that these guys were new. I mean, they start up right. Wow! Sean hits his opponent in the leg. The opponent drops to his knees. Sean backs up. Shoe in place. One, two. But this one guy that you have practiced with for years, you have trained yourself that this is how you fight this individual. Now to prove this point, I take these two guys off the field and I say, from your point of view, what do you do? Each time, what do you do? And his opponent is standing there listening to him. Not knowing that the person who would be the crown prince is standing right here with me, who is also from their area and is very familiar with it. And he says, I always go right down the middle. His opponent, you do not. You always go over here. I do. Every time. So now what are we hearing? We're hearing his opponent knows what happens every time and allows it to happen every time. <laughs> so now I'm real perplexed. <laughs> says, you two don't do either one of those. And then proceeded to explain everything I had just seen. I couldn't have set this up better if I had tried. All of a sudden, from this third voice, from their area, everything was explained. You always do this, and you always do that. And all of a sudden, these two people, and I would bet that if I threw the third person into the mix, which we didn't do, the same thing would occur. Out of those three, they would fight each other the same way. Again and again and again. The one opponent said, I do that because I do not want to contend with his speed. Or that's the only way I can contend with his speed. 
Sean said, I do not, I do what I do because I do not like his strength. Well, it seems to me that if you know that these two people have these capabilities, you're going to train yourself, yourself around them so you can contend with it. That's the idea of our martial art. But yet they had fallen into this trap. And for, for months before that, they had each told me, I'm bored. I, I'm fighting Sean, I'm fighting Gregor, I'm fighting whoever. And we just, I never did anywhere. Well, it was obvious. You know, well, of course not, can you? you? You guys have trained yourself into this, this little, little bundle here that this is how we fight. Yet when they fight each other people, they don't fight anything like that. But three fights in a row, it happened the exact same way. And what was funny is that they didn't okay. So all of a sudden, training becomes very important. They needed to be trained out of it. If you have a tendency, you two fight all the time, and you all of a sudden, with, with sword and shield, and you, you, you know, oh, I, yeah, I fell to that thing, hit me in the head again. That's the same shot he always throws. What? He always throws that. Well, what are you standing there for? <laughs> Very much. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So rearrange things. Practice different things. Train yourself to do different things. Ever fallen victim to being in a tournament and oh, that's your, your oh, the, the fight's announced and it's your your opponent. Oh, I fought him six months ago. No problem. He does this, this, and this. And then you went out there. He didn't do this, this, and this. He did that, and you're laying on the ground. All right. No preconceived ideas about you or your opponent. It's Duke so-and-so. Yes, so. Sir so-and-so. Oh my God, it's what's his name with the great sword. You've just affected that metal part that you need to fight. So no preconceived idea. Okay. How many in here feel as if when they walk out onto the field against Duke Comar, that they've already lost. <laughs> Why? Half. <laughs> out, of, out of the mouth of babes. I was correct. Why? He is the one sport. <clears throat> yeah? And when you walk out on the field. No, sir. I don't buy his rock You know what you don't? But yet, how do we combat that fact? We know there are people out there that we feel that way about. Okay? We've trained ourselves to feel that way about them. Not only that, our 62 buddies that we hang out with have all trained us because, oh shoot, you get to fight Comar in the next round, you're out of here. <laughs> you know, you know, you sit there, oh my god, you know, oh my god, it's, it's so and so. You just seen the scenario so many times. Exactly. <laughs> You've seen the and, fight and of course, Omar has done everything he can to promote this <laughs> scenario. <laughs>
Because remember, it's not that person doing it to you. It's you doing it to yourself, and you have trained yourself into that. Again and again and again. Now that knowing that, that, that his grace is so deadly, how many of you make sure you fight him all the time? Good. He said there's no problem. I'm going to tell him that when he gets to it. <laughs> um, but yet, there's so many people that won't go fight him. He's scary. He is not big and he's not scary. He's Mike, for God's sake. And he fights with a stick. Yeah, so you're Bob Four. You fight with a stick. That, that, make, that make you feel any better, doesn't it? That make you feel any better at all. You try, you try and find that common ground and make everybody feel good. It's like, no, he's still going to kick my butt. I'm sorry, pal. You've got no idea what this guy can do. Right? But if you do that to yourself, okay, and you're going to try and compete, you will mess up that mental, physical thing you need. Do you have a question? Well, I think, yeah, because you're talking about having no preconceived ideas. Are you saying that there's no value to learning patterns and tendencies? Ah, we haven't got to that. But the, good, good point. What I'm saying in no preconceived idea is the fact that six months ago you fought so and so, this guy wasn't very good, so I'm not going to worry about it. And you've done that to yourself in the tournament mode. So you walk out onto the field and you've got this preconceived idea that this guy's no good. You know, and in six months he could have developed all kinds of technique. He could have just, you know, this guy could have just blossomed. Well, the last time you saw him, he was fighting sword and board, he comes out of the tournament floor team. Oh, well, if he was no good with sword and board, how good can he be with floor team? Oops. <laughs> you know, this guy's this guy has got mixed master on his back. And there's a reason they nicknamed him that. So try, try and have no preconceived idea on what your opponent may or may not do, nor what you will or will not do. Okay. More fighters have been messed up. Well, so-and-so always opens with this shot. Well, said he doesn't open with that shot. Two things have occurred. Number one, your preconceived idea of victory just went out the window. And now you're not sure because you've told yourself what he does all the time. Since that rule has changed, now you're not sure what he might do. So you start to, you don't want to defeat yourself in any way, shape, or form, or boost yourself up so much that you're sure what's going to happen and then it doesn't happen. Okay? If you notice, most of the stuff we're talking about is almost all on the mental end. That's where I tend to try and train people. Because it is the part, to me, that appears to be least paid attention to. You know, they, everybody will say, oh yeah, yeah, I went out to the bell, and they showed me how to throw these shots. And then you start to practice, and oh yeah, this was great, I was swinging, I was swinging, I kept losing, but I kept, you know, I, I, you know, I, kept, I couldn't block anything. You couldn't block anything, where was your shield? What well, was right there? Because as beginners, you will go through this, I guarantee you, you will go through what, what I term uh, an offensive lockout, or a defensive lockout. You will be able to do one thing or the other against Duke Comar. Get the defense thing down. <laughs> Save yourself. <laughs> but trying to learn to do both at the same time will take quite a bit of work. Now, then, how do we do both at the same time? Uh, could somebody just want to do sword and board? Anybody just go and grab your sword and shield? Oh, we have one. Either or, either or. Fine. Now, since we know for a fact that we can do an offensive maneuver and we can do a defensive maneuver, it should then follow that we can do both at the exact same moment. Uh, and who trains themselves to do that? What? Are you scratching your nose or are you saying yes? Okay. Some of you guys. Oh, I, I, thought, man, I thought that was possibly what I mean. So, now, what we're going to do here, in a very slow speed, we're going to train you to do both at the same time. We will call this the block as you strike drill. Alright? So what's going to happen here is at a very slow speed, when you throw a blow at me, I will throw one at you. Okay? Thus, you should move 
your shield. Right. So go ahead and, and just, just very slowly start to push that. Now I'm going to move as soon as he does. Okay? As soon as he does. I am not going to do this. Go ahead and move. I'm not going to wait and try and make sure I get my defense on his shot. I'm going to move at the very same moment he does. Okay? Very same moment. I don't care if you hit him in the shield. Repeatedly. Look familiar? It's a reaction drill. Just like the trigger drill. Except now, both people are moving. Alright? The drills are based on try and get a reaction drill. And it will take time, no matter how experienced you are, to work into this with people. Now the other one is the reverse. I go first. Okay? So now let's strike as you block. Okay? So what we're going to do is as I throw one, you go. Okay? So that's what, we're, that's what you do. Again and again and again and again. Great drills. Okay? Now at first you stand still and across from them. Later on, you move. Okay? Staying in range. Which brings us to another drill. The range drill. This is another one that kind of messes people up. We've got a lot as you strike. Yet. 
Okay? Because it follows that if this sword is in range, for him to strike me with it, oh, he's in my range. Unless my weapon is a lot shorter than his. And in these drills, you don't do that. Not at first. Okay? Later on, you start mixing the weapons. Why? Because you want him to realize when he's in range of a great sword. When he's in range of a pole arm. Okay? Just so he gets the idea of how close I can and cannot be. And also, that when he goes into a tournament, in a, in a, do you guys have five weapon lists? Things like that? We have five different weapons? Not very often. Oh, not very often. Okay. In, in our kingdom, that's the way the King's Champion is chosen. It's a, a list that has, I believe, five different, you have to fight five different weapons. So it's real important to, to remember when you're jumping from, from fight to fight, oh yeah, you know, that by the way, this is the pull arm thing, and the reason you just ate that thrusting tip is because you stepped into three feet. All right, thank you. Let's take a break.
your opponent is standing here. Okay? Reactionary opponent. Right? So he's trained himself in range, low recognition, all this stuff, target recognition. He's trained himself in delivery and recovery. As you approach him in a straight line, along these lines here, he is going to know for a fact that the forward targets, i.e. your leg, and especially that lead leg, whichever one it is, each step you take towards him, will come into range first. Which is probably real bad. <laughs> so he knows that when you start crossing these lines, that out here somewhere, the lead leg starts to become a target for him. He knows that for a fact. Okay? As you progress, he knows when your helmet comes into range. He knows when your back comes into range. Okay. Hands of people who practice striking their opponent in the back parts. Very good. Very good. So, if you're, if you're one of these people, and as, as we've seen, the predominant style is to stand there and wait. Okay? He's going to stand there and wait, all right. Okay? Especially if he knows that you're going to continue to approach him. Why? Because you know that you have to get close enough to hit him. Sound like a trap? It should. Yeah. Kind of goes into, yeah, Omar's going to kill me. I just. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. Increases the and his percentages of killing you are going to go up if you continually do this. He knows for a fact that most people are going to approach him with extreme caution. The man is armed and dangerous. <laughs> Him who robbed the store enough, but this guy's armed and dangerous, and he's waiting for me. Don't you? I'm not going to just walk up to him. No way. No, this guy's going to have to earn this guy. What there is left of it. So, all of a sudden, if your partner's over here, and his prime ready position is set, and you know it's ready to go off, why would you walk in there? Because you're tired of looking at You know? Was it you want to see that headshot again? <laughs> I don't think I want to see that headshot again. Right? So, there's obviously one of, one of the things that many people in the, in the West have practiced on is the crescent. Okay? To where there is no straight line, therefore your opponent does not exactly know when you're going to come into range. Heck, you can stay in aggressive forever and never get in range. Then there's variations. The cutback syndrome. Okay? Start walking the crescent, and all of a sudden you come forward with one foot. Why? Because you want to see what he's going to do. Okay? So you can put him in a position of giving you a target. Okay? Hands of people that not only do this, but they don't throw a shot on the way in. Look at this, everybody's trained not to do that. I guarantee you we'll find somebody when we get in there. Right? Why? You don't know who I am. You go to a tournament, you see a guy you don't know, you know what he's going to do. So all of a sudden, the little battle computer you've got against everybody you know is kind of twitching going, I don't know what this guy can do. All of a sudden, you're taking more time. You're thinking. Reactionary fighter, he could care less. You're thinking. So we're going to see how the variation in my style, okay, which is incredibly mobile. Okay, I don't stay on one side. I'll go all around if I can. And why? Because now that we've determined what the strength style is, we'll train to defeat it. Why? Why would we train to do anything else? What happens most of the time? We train into it. It's the strength style, therefore I will do it. All of a sudden you start getting these fights where 
you know, whoever tweaks each other in the face first wins. Well, if you walk up to that guy in a straight line, I guarantee you, you're going to put your beak right where he wants it. Because there's nothing easier than walking straight up to him and right into his weapon for the both of you, really. Right? But the experienced fighter, his percentages are higher. Uh, from, from the strength style, so the, the major killing blow is to the face. What combination is it? Highest percentage of combination. So you were like offside or offside like ground. That's only one blow. Okay. Okay. Offside. So which one? Leg ground. Oh, the other one. Oh, okay. Right. Not, not, see, yeah. Again, we're going into terminology because okay. I can throw an offside leg ground. Okay. So, so you, right. you go offside to get the shield, get the shield over here, and then you're going to go break the leg. Okay. Or the same. Way. And, and the reason you're going to take that leg. Versus hit me in the head because my shield is going to come back to here is training intensity. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we we could go through this and we we probably find two or three of these little glitches. So why do you hit the guy in the head? What do you mean? I was trying to hit him in the leg. Huh? Exactly. Exactly. Up, down, up, down. Which is one of the primary ways we fight. Okay. Once this guy has his shield up. We go down. He has his shield down. We go up. Okay? Yet, it makes just as much sense that if it's up, you stay up. Why? Because he's going to put it down. Why? Because he can't see. Okay? So thus we come into fakes. Fakes throw? Lots of Okay? Thrust predominant, thrust predominant fake. Thrust fake and leg grab. Thrust face forward. Thrust fade low to the leg wrap or straight leg. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So, again, right about here. You're going to run into that thrust fade. And you're going to be set for it because you're what? Okay. It's not like you're sallying up to the guy and taking your time moving around a bit. No, you're telling him right where all these targets are. He moves, he does the thrust fake, and what do you do? Well, you shield up. Exactly. Why? That's the only part of the And you've been trained to do so. See any tendencies and predictability here? Isn't that why a fake works, though? A fake works because the person who is receiving it has been trained to respond to a sword movement. Now, had that person been trained to respond to a sword movement of a predetermined length, or at a predetermined range, he might not fall for that. Why? It's not real. That fake that's being thrown is meant for you to bite on it. But if you actually looked at it on the videotape, you'd be going, why did I do that? Why did I move? I wasn't, you know, I wasn't even in range yet. He wasn't even in range yet for that. You know, I mean, and it didn't look real. All he did was this. He just went to here. That's not a blow. Right. It's one of the reasons we use the thrust. And I call it thrust fake. But I'm driving my sword directly through your belt button. If you don't block it, you're dead. Right. So, but it comes out. It's a combo. But the deal is, is that if you're driving this thing towards my belt buckle, you must be Forward. That's a heck of a reactionary target for me to go after is this hole, which you now can't get your shield into. Right? But look how well that fake works. It's a predominant fake. Yet if we look at it, we're going, what's this for? Right? Again, we're going back to the way people are trained. Okay? You see that fake, you bite on it. Right? You see that fake respond to it. Real difference. Okay. Percentage of blows thrown when blocking that fake. Yeah, you're going to try to kill this guy. Why? Because his sword's down here. Probably not very many. Not very many. Okay. The fake is doing its job. Why? Because people don't train and practice to defeat it. Most fakes that are thrown are successful simply because of that fact. Okay. 
We are training and practicing to use against our opponent what he has trained himself to do. Respond. He has trained himself to respond to a blow by moving the shield, leaning backwards, backing up, stepping sideways, pulling the shield, looking over here. Whatever it is, he is responding. Okay? And that is the way he has trained himself to respond versus killing. Right? Killing. Boom. Whatever. He has trained himself to survive, he thinks. I will survive this shot. It's not a shot, it's a fake. Right? So, back to this. If I'm not walking straight into him, go ahead. Go ahead. Let's take a look at this. Okay. Experienced fighter, extremely experienced fighter. I'm over here. Okay, why am I going to knowing, knowingly walk in here? Now you can see it from here, okay? If he takes one step, okay, go ahead and bring your bring your rear foot. Oh, yeah. yeah, just just a full step. I mean, I'm really in range. Okay. He didn't even have to stay still to know. Which is another thing that can happen. You're walking in here thinking he's going to stay that way. You know, and you're walking in, he moves the ball, and what do you do? Right? Why? You didn't expect that. You know? You know? You know, but how many times have you walked up? Right? Instead of, let's try it again, okay? Walking in, walking in. Why? Because that came forward. What did that do? Brought this and this right into my view. Right? Brought it right into my shield range. Okay? Hooks and presses. Used, not used. Used. Used? Okay. Okay. Some of us use a lot. Right. Now what's interesting about that is, is in this form, it is really set to use a press against. Okay? It really is. Where is it? Do you see it? All of you. Right. But the even better one. Let me grab this one here. The other one here, when you're standing here, okay, you're, you're out here. Right? And you want to approach this guy, right? Does this look familiar to anybody who's trained with me? <laughs> All right. You do, you do not have to use your defense first. So what you're doing here is, he is now telling me right where everything is lined up. Okay? I'm coming from here. Now I know if I do this, what have we already determined? As he steps forward, okay, I'm in trouble here because I don't have a response. But as I'm approaching and he steps forward, it's like, and you just grab it. You can do whatever you want with him here. Okay? Make sure you get your shield on this, preferably locking him. Okay? This is a real ugly press. Because <laughs> <laughs> now he needs to recover. Okay? And as he starts to recover, alright? I won't let him go. I'm not going to touch him with my shield. Okay? I'm going to try and make sure that I've got that press in here. Not legal to touch your opponent with that shield. He might run his arm into it or whatever, but you cannot touch him. Okay, don't, don't, don't try to this and go, mm. he is not going to be happy. Alright, so, all of a sudden, walking in in a straight line isn't such a bad deal. Right? Because if he moves, when he, he and his shield and weapon come into my range, I have a reaction. My reaction is not, mm. My reaction is towards him. Okay. So now as he's sitting there, I'm going, well, let's go ahead and go through the, through the thrust phase. Okay, we're coming in, right? So probably where your shield is, I would use it, but I can still demonstrate. Exactly. Okay, same kind of thing. You're coming in here, and you're walking in again in a straight line. Right again, yeah, about there. Right. Somewhere right in here, okay, because I know the weapon range pretty much. I know that right about here you can do something. Right? So. Not that there's a preconceived idea, but again, as he goes to respond, okay, let's try the, let's try the reaction. Okay, when he moves, okay. Okay. 
When he moves, let's go ahead and get it down here. But get over here. Where does target go? Oh, wait. Everything in his little combat computer has now been reset, Brian, because you're over here. And believe me, there's not anything worse to have happen to you than you go into a, into a set position and everything has realigned. Alright? And now you're somewhat stuck. Okay? Everything's been reset for him. And that's what you want to do. Okay? Now as he goes, let's go the other way. Alright? We're starting to come in, he goes into that, and now over here. Just as good? You bet. Because I'm not going to leave him there. Why would I leave him set like that? Now the one obvious one, okay, is as you're starting to come in here, you throw it. Throw it in there. Right? Just throw it in there. One, two things happen. The weapon stays up there, and we're back to where we were before. Thank you very much. Okay? If he does throw it, you know he throws that fake, or he goes to throw that shot, what's worse he has? Double kill? Maybe? Get him in the neck. Right? You're going for the kill. All of a sudden, there's different ways of approaching this, but to approach it in a straight line is very deadly. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Oh, man. So how do we go about learning all these different approaches? It's the same kind of thing. I know, again, since I know that the, the thing that counts most is range, I know for a fact that if I want to streamline all these things open up. So somewhere in here I'm going to break it up, maybe I'll stop. Go to the right. Go to the left. Okay. But somewhere in here, you know, two things. You come into range of him, and he comes into range of you. You really need to know where that is, so you do not fall victim to the straight line attack. Have to know. Thus, the range drill. Okay. Trying to get everybody into the mindset. This is how close you really are. So the range drill in all of its forms, i.e. just standing here, okay, like we were doing, the trigger drill, standing there at first, all of it change, and we start moving all over the place. We start switching weapons. But what we'll do today is mostly sword and board. Right. How much time do we want? Ten after eleven. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, set up with. Uh, Sword and board, and we'll start doing some of the drills. <laughs> trigger drill, okay? Trigger drill based on the idea that what we want to do is trigger a response from each other, well, basically from the trainee, okay, as quickly as possible to get him on a target. We don't want him standing there wasting a lot of time thinking about maybe I should shoot at that target. And you try and do them for the upper body, the lower body, the back, obviously all parts of the head, including the wraps. What you do for wraps, you can actually hide your head this way. Okay? Most people don't understand that when people go to block a wrap, and they're standing here like this, and they raise their shield up, what do they leave open? Everything else. Everything else. Okay? Or they, they, they think that, I can't throw that wrap because he's blocked it. Well, the back of his head is still open. All right? So try not to preconceive anything into your blows as far as whether or not that target will or will not be open. Try to learn to complete that shot. The reason being, you need to know how it feels. Now the way I train people is the fact that they are always allowed, when we're in armor, to complete their shots. Okay? I don't block them every time. What use would that be? I'm just doing nothing but building it up in his head that every time I threw that shot, it got blocked. Right? So you try and get this right down to the realism of fighting, realism of the weapon actually contacting that target that he is <coughs> selected. Question? No, no. Okay. <coughs> now that we went through, oh, this is good. I'm going to lose my voice. <coughs> we went through the trigger drill <coughs> earlier. Okay. You want some water? Yes. <laughs> or soda or something.
There's a whole, yeah, a whole big thing of them. I am the trainer. This is the student, okay? The idea here is as soon as I move, he is onto a target, okay? We are not going to judge at first whether or not it was a good choice or a bad choice. First few times you start doing these drills, it's going to be tough enough to get used to doing them, okay? Experienced fighters, when he makes that choice finally, after he's done it, you know, for a week or, or two weeks or whatever with you, then you say, okay. Yes, indeed, when my shield went up, this opened up, but your highest percentage would probably have been to throw to this side of my head for a wrap because I can't see it. If you move in here, I can see you. Okay, so your percentages may go up if you throw to the blind side. Okay, what you will find is tendencies in that, again, when you do this, seeing it moving to the shield side will cause the student to automatically go to the sword side. Why? He's going against where it is moving to. Okay? It's one of those funny things that when you're fighting, you don't think about it like this. You know, you, you, you might not go in there. But when you're going through a drill, things suddenly change because the drill is not combat. Okay? So all of a sudden, the things he's training himself into in combat, which you are now trying to help him with, are correct are now going to be slightly different in a drill. So when you first start out, go ahead, and you, you assume, the trainer will assume his stance, okay? The, the drill has already been explained in that when I start to move, you start to move to a target, okay? We're just building the response. The very minor form of this drill is the fact that all you want them to do is move the sword. Wherever, they're, wherever their ready position is, they start to move. Okay. So if they have a real problem with doing any type of shot, they just have to move the weapon. Just anything to show you that you're getting a reaction of some form. That they're not just standing there thinking about it. All right? So we'll go ahead, and I'm on guard. Now we have the weapon, we have the trainee approach to the range of his weapon. Okay? He is to be allowed to have that comfort zone of, I can reach this guy. Okay? So go ahead and make sure you're, you're in range. No stuff. No step range, okay? Very important in the beginning. No step range. Right? Again, real comfortable, real relaxed. He knows for a fact that if this was combat, he would be able to strike. Okay? So now from here, okay, on guard. Now then, you can move this or you can move the shield, whichever one you want to do. If you want to do something to where both move, try and save it for later. The beginning form of this drill, again, is to give them the comfort of starting to move that sword to a target. You're not trying to get tricky with them, no face, yeah. nothing like that. Very simple. And to, simple to a point of, on guard? Yeah. Okay, where'd he go? Right to where the shield went. Right. Yeah, my head is wide open. Now you don't, you never, you never make a judgment again, okay? You're trying to get them to react. They reacted. Was the reaction good, bad, or different? It doesn't matter at this point. They moved. They didn't stand there and go. They didn't wait. They moved. And that's the part you want. You want the reaction. So again, you line them up, and you just do this repeatedly. And you just start changing things. Okay? Each time you do it, you just change it slightly. You don't have to make it a, a dramatic difference. I mean, you don't have to always do this. Right. Why? Because when you're standing there and your opponent goes to shift direction, okay, you may just do this. Really? You may just suddenly back up. Right. Not completely out of range, but he's just making slight alterations. Why? He's trying to find a spot. Right? And he's moving a little bit at a time trying to find that spot. So if you're trained to react to the targets that are opening and closing as he moves, you could be on the target before it's even perceived by him that it is a target. 
So a lot of these drills are just really, really basic at first. So we're just going to stand here. Okay? And we're going to do movements that we know they're going to see again and again and again. Okay? Now from here, we can actually start getting a little bit more aggressive in that, okay? Now I will move towards you. I'm not going to stand still. Again, getting closer and closer to combat. So from here, I might approach, all right, and let him step wherever he wants. To. Wherever they go is fine. Okay. In the more advanced portion of this, we may indeed start to go to hooks and presses. Okay. So I'll actually push in there and just touch it. Okay. With no body movement. And then, again, the final form is. And I want him to move. We're almost in combat now. It's almost a single movement slow work drill in its final effort. Okay? Trying to show them again the confidence that they can have in just standing there and just developing that trigger to go. Okay. All right, let's split it up. Uh, experienced fighters, let's say, uh, well, you guys know who is, who's really experienced and who isn't. Experienced fighters over here, less, lesser experienced fighters over here. Let's break it down in three years or, or more on that side. Three years or less over here. Let's see what kind of ratio we get there. How many years I've been fighting? I'm over here. <laughs> okay. Three years or more. Okay. A lot of experience. All right, guys. No, we don't. So, nice. Let's break it down a little bit further. I'm going to need about another at least four over here. Oh, that <laughs> yeah, I'll go over here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it, we'll make it worth our while. Did you check to see if maybe it might have been a walk? Okay. So, yeah, I can think it was, it was a new that thing. Okay. Nice fighters, go ahead and, and line up one on one with each of the students. Okay. We're going we're gonna to go through this drill from, from both points of view. So, go ahead and pick. Come on, people, you're going to boot them, they're not going to bite you. I promise. Well, you're going to bite me, but you're out of here. I'm not listening. I'm going to like that. Don't be hurt. Don't be hurt. Okay. 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 Okay.
It's the thing that's moving that will get struck in the beginning. Why? I don't know. You'll find when you start to do this armored, and you actually want them to go ahead and do a full speed reaction, same thing will occur. Don't know why. You move your shield down, they hit you right on the outside of that shield. Put the sword out, you get hit right on the sword. Don't know why. It's one of those things. Any other things that, that popped up for the trainings? Difficulty in, uh, in, in it's not comfortable <laughs> at first to include any kind of motion. The, the comfort level is, okay, I'm standing here and I want to, I want to do only upper body motion. I don't want to step. Right, exactly. One of those things that, gee, we've broken this down as far as we can. We've made this as simple as we can, yet that freedom seems somehow escaping us, right? Part of it is is that we've, we're trained into combat. We know what combat is. You put on armor and you swing sticks at one another and you're, you're trying to hit one another. We, we get into drills and all of a sudden things kind of feel weird. Why? Because we don't do a lot of drills. But this comfort level that you are speaking of is exactly where we want to be when we do combat as well. It's like, oh yeah, I'm comfy. I'm ready to go here. Instead of worrying about what I might do or whatever, whether I'll respond. So all these drills kind of come up and, and kind of push you towards combat gently. They're nudging you into this idea of, okay, I can react. I can react. I know I can do this. The more confident you feel about, I'm comfortable with this, and I know how to do it because I've been trained, practiced, the easier this is going to be. It really is. Plus, you get to see all these problems that, wow, that guy moved his sword, I hit him in the sword. And if it keeps occurring, then there is something to be dealt with. If it does not keep occurring, don't worry about it. Okay? All right, the next drill we're going to do we're going to do the range drill. All right, so for this, let's get all the shields out of the way and keep a weapon. Again, the reason we're getting rid of the shields is to make it as easy as possible, as comfortable as possible, because this drill is to make sure that we know that we're in the range of our weapon. Now, later on, again, what you can do with this drill is to go ahead, if somebody get a pole arm, Somebody get a great sword, make sure the other guy stays and in sword and shield at first, then start mixing the weapons. Great sword against pole arm. You know, just mix them up quite a bit. Why? Because you want the trainee to get the feel of all the weapons. Okay, the reason for that is he's going to use them sooner or later. So he needs it from that standpoint, and he is going to face them. So he needs to recognize right from the start, whoa, that's a pole arm. I, I can't just walk in there. Because a lot of trainees, when they first start out, they make that mistake. I need to get close enough to hit them. But they don't do anything on the way in to try and get the weapon out of the way. Or get it, you know, to a point where, oh, this is, this is safer to approach. Okay, split up into your pairs again. All right. Those of you who are the trainers, okay, you still, let's, let's keep that terminology so we can delineate between the two of you. Put your swords to your side, completely out of the way. You don't want him actually staring, you know, with them staring at that sword. Okay, you want it out of the way. You are, you are totally defenseless. They don't have to worry about this at all. Uh, let's see, can you go ahead and move off? into the grass a little bit because you guys are going to be moving around. You two can come over here. Yeah, make sure you're playing your possession stand. Let's not go careful with that. All right. Now then. Nick, let's see. Trainers, explain the drill to the trainee. Okay. I'm going to leave my shell down. You're going to, uh, first of all, Oh, that's right. You were yeah, the, the rain. That's what we're sorting. I'm going to say. Um, the, the idea of this drill is to, is to make sure that the student understands how to stay in range. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to move him around, and then as sooner or later you stop him, okay, and make sure, when he reaches out, make sure, okay, and, it, and go, go, go ahead and change direction. I mean, don't, don't just do it in a straight line, but push it forward, push it back, pull him sideways, and whenever you want, you say stop, check me, and he'll reach out. If he's not in range, then tell him where you notice the difference in, in his shift. Okay, if it was a backwards move or sideways move, so he can learn the fault in the way he's perceiving that range. Because for some reason, especially when we're going backwards, people have a problem with range. The target goes away from them. They'll either get way too close because it did go away, and I want to get close to it, or, or, or they lay back. They're like, they're not sure. One of the reasons this is because we'll see a change 
I moved away, so I figured I didn't need to worry about hitting you. Right. That's not the drill. The drill is to make sure you can hit it. So, all right. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and start moving, trainers. No problem? Not too many with Losing that one. The That's footing. a good drill. Losing the footing. Lateral movement. Lateral movement. Too fast to start with on beginners. Exactly. How many of you guys were really dancing around just zooming all over the place? Oh yeah, that's all those hands going here. I saw a lot of that. Okay. And that makes it really hard for the trainee to keep up with the drill. Okay? Depending upon their skill level. How many of you were moving around in actual combat form? I mean actually kind of staying upright. I tried. <laughs> right, yeah. made, made a few, made Another a few point. Try and keep them as upright as possible. Try not to get them leaning because you're moving too fast. Okay. Start the drill out rather slowly and then speed up. The one thing that will change the drill is when you start picking up your shields. Okay? Shields add a little bit more realism. They also add more weight and they also add to the fact that you're used to being in this position used to be in position, sword at the ready, shield up. Right? And again, since we're trying to get closer and closer to combat, we want to try and make sure that they are moving in appropriate manner. Okay? When you stop them, if you stop and they're leaning, okay, warn them. Okay? Go ahead and tell them, when you do go to stop, complete the stop movement. Okay? If you're going to stop and you're leaning, go ahead and put the foot forward. Again, getting ready. I'm ready. Okay. Hey trainers, any faults with the drill? Yeah, seems like a really good drill. Yeah, I kind of wanted to, to start because he's he's very much a beginner. I kind of wanted to start him like this mm -hmm. with him as a trainee with the with the weapon actually on me. Sure, exactly. Moving a little bit. Further. Sure, that's fine but too. Didn't because I wasn't quite. What what? But that's a good point. Whatever you find is comfortable. Okay, for the student you're teaching, like we said before, you use that. Whatever it is to get them comfortable with the drill, especially since he's so he's inexperienced, okay? Whatever you can use to make them comfortable, use it. I mean, if you have to do this drill at this speed, okay, and you're staying in somewhat of a ready position, that's fine if they're comfortable with it. If you need to move them a step at a time, then that's fine. Whatever they're comfortable with. The more experienced the opponent, then you can speed things up a bit. Try not to be running around them. Okay? Try, not, try not to do something that, in your mind, as the trainer, is unrealistic to combat. Because, again, we're trying to move towards that. Okay, shields on. Let's try it again. How many people, how many trainees, trainees, were getting in range of the shield and not the opponent? Okay. So all of a sudden, the rules of the game change slightly. Although the tendency here is this one is closer to combat, so the bad news is, is if you're getting in range of the shield here, you may do it in combat. Okay. Any others? Feels kind of odd. We tend to train to fight very up close. Yeah. And as we're moving, if he'd stop, I didn't care. I'd step right on in there, and that felt very comfortable. Yeah, it felt very comfortable, indeed. And all of a sudden, you're saying that in this drill, you are responding the way you're already trained, and you're not responding to what the drill does. And that's a very, very typical thing to have happen. Number one, you're not familiar with the drill. Number two, as was brought up, it goes against a fighting style. Yes, it does. Almost everywhere people like to fight close, sooner or later, it's one of the things that especially experienced fighters know how to do very well. Inexperienced fighters, guaranteed, once you get up here and experience, you are not going to like this. You're going to be, oh, this is a happy place. Shield. <laughs> shield. Yeah. Shield. Uh, shield. About a half step closer. You know? And then all of a sudden it's, well, i got a sword, but these guys are okay. So it gets confusing. Whereas from out here, you can still strike him, right? This was more this was more comfortable staying out here. Okay, and again, we're going after that comfort zone, and we're going after teaching the, the inexperienced fighter that from out here is much better. Okay? Because what's going to happen later on is the experienced fighters are going to force you into staying that close and fighting from there, and you will have to learn that. 
okay? But for the beginning, we're trying to make everything a lot more comfortable so that when you do get here, you will be able to fight from here. It will be just as comfortable. Any other problems with it? I think, I think you're right about following the shield. Yeah. It's a big target to react to. It's a big thing that's moving. Right. And it doesn't really matter, though. It's, it's, you know, this is, you know, if I can hit your shield, you know, your sword's right. It's very it's misleading. You put more it's very misleading. But it is, to a point, the thing that's out there the furthest in a lot of the styles of things. Okay? In the A-frame, it still is. Both of them are out there. Okay? But it sounds like it would be real easy for an a, this A-frame style to actually stay back a bit, even further away, or come closer and vary that distance so that you, the inexperienced fighter might not get a real set and lock on where is his head? How far away is his head? Okay. The other thing to watch out for, again, that we haven't done yet, after lunch, we are going into the A-frame in this drill. Okay, since that seems to be the predominant style, we're going to go into that. Okay. I think the drill will change yet again. And what you're going to see is you are going to really stay in range of that point where those two meet. Okay. We'll, we'll work on that and see if that comes out again from the inexperienced fighter's point of view. Because if it does, now the, now the experienced fighters have something they know they need to work on with the inexperienced. Okay. And I don't know, from, from your point of view, does the A-frame change as far as how far in front of you it is to miss, to give the... De to depends, depends what I'm fighting and who I'm fighting. Okay, so it does change. So you'll need to know that. As, as, as an experienced fighter, you'll need to know that they may change that on you. Okay. All right, let's break for lunch. Mm-hmm. 